Thank you for joining I Am Possible, which is India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Mr. Emmanuel Goffey, who's the co-director and the co-founder at Global AI Ethics Institute. He has served in the French Air Force for 27 years and has worked on military ethics and more precisely on ethics applied to lethal autonomous weapons and his current focus is ethics applied to artificial intelligence. So Emmanuel, it's a complete pleasure and honor to have you on the show and I've been waiting to have a conversation with you because I think this is the first conversation I'll be having somebody who's got expertise and vested in military AI ethics. And the world that we have you know, gone in is a world where technology is going to play such a huge role. It's it's touching every single facet of our lives, right? From education, healthcare, entertainment, training, and military, military and defense. And, and that's one area which is, is something which has personally has has scared me a lot. And and. and and that's the reason I've been really waiting to have this conversation and understand what's the global regulation, you know, when uh, uh, when we're talking about autonomous weapons, killer robots. So really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Why don't we start with a brief introduction, your background, so my audience gets to understand who's Mr. Emmanuel yeah. Goffey and possibly also a brief introduction of what Global, global AI Ethics Institute is and what it does. Yeah, sure. Th th thanks, Eddie, for having me today. It's it's uh, it's, it's a delight for, for me to, to to be here and to have this uh, this opportunity to discuss this uh, odd topic with you. Obviously, and I understand that you're scared by all the things. Uh, myself, I'm scared, and lots of people are really scared about that. For for many reasons, because first, it's scary in itself, but also because there is a big myth about you know AI and in, in the military. So basically, about about me, as you were saying, that I've I've served in the uh, French Air Force. For 27 years, uh, actually, uh, I was an officer. I was a specialist in international relation, basically, and I've uh, I've been also assigned to work on the use of drones and the ethics of, of military and the use of drones at a time where the CIA was using its drones in uh, you know in the Pakistanis uh, in a tribal zone, right? Uh, that was kind of ethically disputable, right? And at the very same time, the French were considering um, renewing their, their their fleet of drones. So there was kind of a reluctance from the, you know, the, the general public toward those systems, right? So we had to make sure that we would not make the same mistake as the US, right? So I started working with that and slowly we were discussing about uh, what you call the uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems, which are basically, let's say, unmanned systems like drones that are fitted with AI, right? And that are made, that are able to make decisions by themselves without any kind of human control or re really limited human control. Uh, so basically, um, I, I slowly um, moved from the from the military side to the AI side to uh, to become a specialist in, in that. Uh, and, and then I left the military and moved to Canada and started working on this uh, AI things and, and the ethical uh, aspect of, of the development of artificial intelligence, which is, I think, Quite interesting. Um, then we created with a friend of mine, Atsum Momsilovic, uh, in uh, in Croatia, this uh, this the Global AI Ethics Institute, which is uh, a think tank that is located in Paris, a global think tank, international think tank, uh, located in Paris, um, with this specific aim, which is because it's some, some, something that is lacking in the debate around AI, uh, which is um, aiming at actually raising awareness about the cultural dimension of any ethical assessment of artificial intelligence. Basically, what we can see today is that the West is leading the debate, is leading all the publication and all the guidelines that have been uh, established so far. Uh, and there is a lack of voices from, let's say, India, uh, Africa, or Southern America, or even the Middle East, or China, right? Big powers that are here in, in the field of artificial intelligence, but you don't hear about the cultural dimension of it and the concerns those part of the world or those countries or geographical areas have regarding AI. The relation to technology, if you go to Japan, is really different than the relation that we have here in France or in, in the in the West at large, right? Uh, so, so this is something that is really lacking and, and we feel like, ethically speaking, it's something that is unacceptable just to have this, um, uh, this Western perspective that is imposed all around the world without taking into account the cultural 
dimension of, of you know the relation with AI. Thank you for explaining. I mean, what you've been doing. I, w- I would like you to explain a little bit about uh, global AI ethics a little bit more and what it does because you rightfully pointed out. You know, it's it's the Western countries, specifically America, which is leading the conversation when it comes to global AI ethics. You know, but there is a total and utter lack of representation of uh, other nations. Talk, talk to me about, you know, your, uh, the Global AI Ethics Institute and how is it that you are playing a role into, uh, you know, raising awareness and and having more diverse, uh, inclusive voice into this zone? If, if you really look at all the guidelines and documents that are related to, uh, to AI ethics, uh, almost 70% of them have been published or issued by Western countries, right? And if you look at the at the map, Africa, for example, is is almost totally absent from the debate. Uh, India is is almost totally uh, uh, absent from the debate. China is a little bit here with three, four documents. Even if China, you know, it is one of the big leaders with the U.S. in in the in the field of AI. Um, what we are doing with the Global AI Ethics Institute, once again, it's 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 a really young institute. It has been created in April last year, so it's almost one year. Um, what we've we've done so far is first we've tried to gather lots of people that are working in the field of artificial intelligence from all around the world. I think that we have 18 countries represented um, uh, in, in our expert members, executive board, and the advisory board of the, of the, uh, of the Institute. That people that are not only ethicists, because we don't want to just do philosophy for the sake of philosophy. We need people that are working in AI on an everyday basis, right? That have the knowledge of what it is to program an algorithm and work with AI. So we get lots of people that are different backgrounds, culturally speaking, but also professionally speaking. And this enrich our thoughts and, and our understanding of the stakes um, uh, related to AI. And then we're participating to lots of conferences, just trying or writing papers, academic papers and academic journals or, or chapters, just to say, look, we have at some point to listen to others, right? Uh, it's not because we are the Western, the Western world, the global North, that we have kind of a superiority in terms of, of, of you know, lecturing other countries, telling them what is acceptable, what is not acceptable on an ethical basis. So, so this is what we are trying to promote all the time in all the conferences we've, we've, uh, we've given some 60 talks and conferences and meetings last year uh, we've written uh, many papers and once again we're just trying to say okay be careful about that we are doing something that might lead to tensions let's say let's talk about for example china china is one of the big leader and they've clearly asserted that they would become the world leader in in the field of artificial intelligence uh, I, I don't feel like china and they will become the leader when they will be leaders they will accept for example the european union to lecture them all tell them what they have to do, what they must not do, right? That's not the way it works at the international level. When you're a big power, you impose your uh, your agenda. You do not respect agendas that are, com- that are coming from others. And the other thing that we've um, quite recently created, and now we are in the process of, of using it, it's a group of experts in non-Western ethics. So we've been able with the Institute to gather some 24 high level experts in Buddhism, in Native American speaking, in, in, in Maori thoughts, in Aboriginal Australia, uh, in Muslim thinking, Vedic thinking, uh, just to have this kind of group and, and ask these people, and we, start, we will start working with them, uh, to see what might be, I would not say an ideal, but a, an alternative system of governance of artificial intelligence, instead of having this Western perspective, with, which is, okay, let's set this kind of universal code of conduct with you know um, uh, western oriented concerns with western oriented solutions let's let's discuss with all those people and let's discover what they have in their mind and how they see the future of ai how they see how ai can be you know introduced in, in their societies in their communities in their beliefs in their political system etc cetera, etc cetera, right and and so far because I've, I've worked with lots of people all around the world i i, I can see huge differences uh, for example about privacy which is one of the big principles that you promoted within the european union when you look at the buddhist perspective and especially with professor soraj Ongladaram, uh, you can see that from the buddhist perspective privacy is is seen totally differently because uh, privacy is related to the self to the existing self in the western world and in the buddhist perspective you do not have such thing as the self so you do not own your data because yourself does not exist in itself so the perspective on the world the understanding of the the, the stakes that are related to ai and privacy or data or the, the, the governance of data is totally different uh, um, and also i want to to, to mention 
an insightful work done by a uh, Muslim scholar, Amana Rakib uh, in Pakistan. She wrote uh, this book, Islamic uh, Ethics of Technology. And, and, and she's putting also at the center of her reflection, the Sharia, which is the religious rules that are regulating everyday's life uh, in the Muslim world, right? And, and when you think about that, that's totally different from the perspective that we have here in the West. So the point is not to say, I have to agree with Chinese people. I do not have to agree with Muslim people or Indian people. The I have to listen to them because they are here. I cannot deny their the right to have their own perspective or their own ideas. I must enrich my thought uh, instead of creating tension by saying, okay, what we call, you know, AI colonialism. Uh, so we, we should avoid that definitely because history has shown that it doesn't work. So profound. I need to take it all in because yes, I think, you know, the world is just talking. Everybody's, nobody's listening. And, and, and you said it's so important to listen to everyone, gather all of the stakeholders and, and not just the nations in large you know see if you can what you're doing i think is so brilliant you know looking at every different you know culture and religion getting their voices to be heard because i guess you know sometimes you have to do a go slightly away from possibly the experts you know maybe there is because you know experts in the field are so vested and so narrowly focused that they miss out the broader implication of it and possibly the solution lies by talking to more people having more diverse representation and possibly passing those uh, information or data of those di diverse uh, thoughts into something which can be globally beneficial rather than you rightfully pointed out that just, uh, you know, going with a, a, a one, uh, you know, perspective of, of the, the, the West. And so far, even with artificial intelligence, I think Hollywood has painted a picture of, you know, the Terminators and stuff like that. So, so the broader view is that, oh, we're going to be, uh, you, you know, like there'll be Terminators. And, and so either the, the media has painted that picture of that scare, scary, dark, dystopian future or the media paints a picture, oh, it's nothing's going to happen. But nobody is looking at the middle path where let's have conversation. Because this technology is growing, we don't really know what's going to go, go and how deep that impact is. So, yep, yep. so let's have a, a, a conversation, and that yeah, yeah. is missing. And I really hope that you know the global AI ethics becomes that organizations which gathers all nations yep. and stakeholders and uh, all people, and, and create a solution where we talk about the regulation uh, mm -hmm. of this awesome technology because technology per se is not good or bad it's the people who choose it yeah. into using it in a specific way can be you know leveraged for good or bad so yeah. sticking to autonomous weapons uh, unmanned drones uh, ai powered weapons would you kind of mind explaining what it is and how dangerous it is and, and what's the impact of it? Because I just saw this Future of Life Institute, which had created a video, which is on the YouTube title Slaughterbots uh, of a dystopian future. And it looks scary. So if you can unpack, you know, unmanned drones, autonomous weapons, killer rob robots, that'll be really helpful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The, the, actually, uh, when we talk about unmanned system, basically these are you know the, the basic systems that we already know, like airplanes or, or you know military ships and these kind of things uh, that are actually freed from human being inside the system. Right? Doesn't mean that you don't have any kind of human being because you can have remote control by operators. For example, that's the case for drones. Right? But what we've what we've tried to create and what is already on the battlefield uh, are systems that are partly able to make their own decision. They, they can adjust, they have lots of sensors, they will just take a lot of data all around and they will make decisions about where they are going and how they are going there and if they have to go, to go slower. They might also just um, uh, provide uh, operators with information about the potential target. So what we are doing so far is that we're trying, this This, this is the, uh, the narrative. We are trying to keep uh, operators in the loop, meaning that some decision that are that might be, for example, about killing people or, or, or arming injuring people might might stay in the hands of human beings, right? So you have different perspective. You have human in the loop that is just you know triggering the. Uh, and the uh, deciding to, to to kill or not to kill, you have human out of the loop, human by the loop, etc. But we we keep try to keep 
a human being uh, somewhere in the loop to make decisions. But we are slowly moving towards something that would be really um, uh, different, which is, let's say, for example, unmanned uh, vehicles like drones that are able to take off by themselves without any kind of human supervision, that are able to decide where they're going and if they must you know, change their, 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 their way, and even to decide when they might you know, uh, open fire on a specific target. So this is where we have difficulties because what we think, uh, and especially that, that, that's once again, that's a really Western perspective. I don't know for other, uh, other culture if they, the, the perspective would be the same, but in the Western perspective, we consider that you cannot kill someone without uh, a human decision behind, right? Uh, it, it, it is deemed unacceptable, ethically speaking, to have a system that would decide, okay, I will kill this person, right? Uh, so basically what we think is that those autonomous systems will be able to gather a lot of data they will be able to process them and to make decision, wise decision or, or, or efficient decision based on this data and, and, and the process as to which they, they went. So this is a bit concerning because obviously technology is not perfect, so they might make uh, you know mistakes. And, and the big decision that we have uh, to, to make behind that is that we will be responsible in case of misdeeds committed by these kind of systems. Uh, we, we, Will we be available, for example, to, to to put the military into trial, the political leaders, or even the uh, the programmers of the system, or whoever has, has been involved in the in the, the design and the development of the system? Who would be responsible if the system kills by mistake someone that was innocent? Right. So that, that's that's one of the big problems that we have today. Regarding the future of life institutes, they are doing a great job, but. It's it's like the you know the movement which is called uh, killer robots uh, stop killer robots. Uh, these are two groups of NGOs that are um, let's say fighting against the development of such systems. So their objectivity can be questioned the same way that military objectivity in government might be questioned regarding the use of drones. So we really have to be cautious about uh, about these kind of videos that are that are, that are provided by these um, by these NGOs because obviously they're they're promoting their own perspective on the future of of that. But to some to some extent, and that's really interesting, we cannot deny the fact that it is possible that at some point what they are showing us in these kind of videos might happen. So where they are doing a great job, but that does not work that much, to be honest, we're doing where they are doing a great job is that they are telling us, okay, ask yourself the right question right now. Do not wait until it will be too late to move back, right? Because when we will be uh, in, in this situation, when we, are, we will have these kind of robots, these terminators, or, or those drones, autonomous systems that will make their own decision, that will kill others, that will be too late, right? And, and there is no way back. So think about it right now. For example, the Stop Killer Robots campaign, what they are saying is they ban all those systems until we have a regulatory framework until we have laws that will frame the use, the development, marketing, et cetera, et cetera, of those systems, right? But we know that governments are not really keen on having this kind of constraints. And there has been discussion since 2014 at the CCW, which is the conventional, the convention, sorry, on certain conventional weapons uh, each year in Geneva. And, and we see that lots of countries, the US, Australia, and, and lots of other countries are not keen on having this kind of, of you know, constraints, legal constraints. So nothing is really moving. And, and, and actually, we're developing those drones, those systems uh, more and more um, without really considering the potential um, harmful consequences of it. These technologies are growing out of hand and if it's not shaped in, in a place which is human first, human benefic benefit, it can be extremely, extremely disastrous. You, you spoke about uh, regulation and I, I guess, I mean, every nation, the way it works is, you know, we are all very capitalistic oriented. You know, we all want to acquire a certain technology or certain advantage over another nation because it gives you an advantage over the another nation. In a scenario like this, where it's always, okay, I want to be better than you and because that's the way the capitalist framework functions do you see a regulatory framework ever falling in place um i guess there are two options my, my, my guess would be that there would not be any kind of you know efficient regulations uh, even on, on the long term because you get uh, superpowers that are once again not keen on being constrained by um, by, by legal norms uh, what might happen is that we, we we may have this kind of you know really superficial really weak 
regulation that we call soft laws, right? Uh, just for the sake of having it and saying, okay, look, we've, we've reached a point when we have something, but we all know that it doesn't work because it is so weak that every country can find a way just, you know, to overcome and to bypass the, the laws and to find things. And the other point is that because AI and those technologies are, are evolving so fast, even if you set a specific regulation at one point, after five, six, seven years, uh, it won't work anymore because it won't be adapted or adjusted to the new coming technologies. So that's the big issue with, with, with the laws is that it cannot adjust as fast as the technology is evolving, right? This is where we're just putting ethics into the equation because ethics is, is quite flexible. So you can change it quite fast, which is not the case with, uh, with uh, uh, legal norms. But I, I don't think that we will reach that point where we'll have this kind of really serious and, 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 and really you know, efficient legal uh, norms and, and systems that will frame the use of, of these systems. Because as you were saying it in the capitalist uh, world we live in, uh, there are many things that must be taken into account before ethics. Uh, first is map power, right? Uh, we, all countries and all geographical areas are trying to get as much power as possible. So AI is a new source of power. So we need AI. Then there is a financial aspect of it, right? Uh, in in 20, uh, 2021, the, the market on, in, on AI, uh, military AI, was estimated at something like 7 billion US dollars, right? It is expected to double by 2028 to reach $14 billion, right? So that's big money, big money, really big money. Then you also have all the, uh, the when you're developing, when you're doing research and development in the military AI, that might be, and most of the time, it, what happens is that it has application in the civilian world. So it's not, you know, related only to the military. You're searching some, something about, let's say, facial recognition to what is used in Ukraine, for example, to recognize soldiers. That might have at some point an application in the civilian world. So this is what we call dual technology. So it has an impact on the military, it has an impact on the civilian world, right? So you make money on the military, you make money on the civilian world. So these this, this are the things that you have to think about when you are thinking about regulating AI or regulating the uh, least autonomous weapons is that we must, we, we can be idealists, we must not be naive, right? On the top of the priority of governments, of states, ethics is not there. Ethics is really low, right? It's really low. When it comes to money and power and, and being a superpower and the leading power like China wants to be or the US is already in, in terms of AI, uh, you know, the, 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 the power, the, the, the race for power is so strong that ethics is, is you know, collapsing really low uh, in, in, in the list of priorities. That's terribly sad. Now, the, the next question I, I want, I, I think, you know, everyone who's possibly listening in to feel what's going on in, in a world and what will happen if they don't be involved and raise a voice so i'm just gonna read out a couple of uh, uh, situations which has already happened like in united nations the report there was a report which said turkey used autonomous firing by its cargo two drones to hunt fleeing soldiers in libya's civil war then drones were used in Panjshir Valley uh, in Afghanistan by Taliban's, which was assisted by the Pakistani military to capture the last bastion, which is uh, Panjshir Valley. Then there was AI, which was used by Israel to elim eliminate Iran, an Iranian nuclear scientist. How do we involve people and make them understand that it? No nation is free because every I think the Europeans thought that oh it's never gonna touch them unless an I mean that Russia just woke up and said okay let's let's uh, uh, you know attack uh, Ukraine I mean nobody is safe I, I you know I live in India but I'm sure every government even Indian government are doing things which are really really scary and not in in the benefit of uh, its, its civilians so how do we make people understand and and you know be part of this larger conversation and making them aware that if they are not aware nobody is spared it, it, they're gonna it's yeah. gonna come to their doorstep also yeah it's, I think I think it's, it's it might be 
very difficult, uh, if, if not impossible, to make people aware of that for, for many reasons. First of all, because lots of people do not care about that. They have other, you know, uh, problems uh, uh, that they have to, to, to deal with, that they have to solve on an everyday basis, right? So maybe wars and the use of drones is definitely not one of their uh, top priority concern, uh, which is understandable then, because it's also a complex issue. So either you were talking about the future of life institute to make things, okay, look, that's really scary. Uh, we are moving toward the Terminator, this kind of things, right? Uh, which is not objective, right? Because you are promoting something that you think uh, would be the future, which is not the case. Or on the other end, your government say, no, don't worry, we will always have this human in the loop, human control over the system. Yeah, right. So, but the reality is just in between and it's really complex and depends on the system it depends on the interest it depends on the country it depends on the technology that you have it depends on the resources that you have to develop this technology it depends on lots of things so it would take hours days weeks and months to explain to the people what exactly is at stake for each country each part of the world the economical you know stakes the political stakes the power stakes etc et that that would be that would be really complex and finally uh, government are not keen on putting that on the table, right? It's secrecy. And this is where this, there is something really interesting from the European perspective. We are promoting transparency when it comes to artificial intelligence. But the problem is not that the AI is not transparent. The problem is that the people that are developing AI in the military industry are not transparent about what they're doing, right? They're not really informing us about what their agenda is. And, and myself, uh, I've, I've worked, as you mentioned it at the very beginning of this discussion in the military. Uh, I, I was part of this kind of discussion, what we call, you know, language element, just trying to sell things to the people, you know, that were, they were reluctant uh, regarding the use of drones. So we were, we were, um, uh, were expected to, to shape the narrative, say, okay, look, we're not going toward the Terminator. I remember clearly about drones in France, we're saying, okay, we will never have armored drones, never. Okay, we just have drone for civilians. Okay, and then we bought those uh, U.S. drones that are not armed, but that you can harm, right? And at some point, we've harmed those drones, and we're now using armed drones in the Sahel region, right? So it's all about the narrative. It's all the political communication that you are using in order to make people accustomed to the use of these systems and to accept it slowly. So something that look really unacceptable at some point, might be acceptable after 10 years and after a really strong communication system. So, I mean, and that's not only the French government, that the US government is doing the same, the Chinese government is doing the same. Depending on the political system that you have, it's easier uh, than, than, than for other governments. But, and I think in, in India, it would be definitely the same, right? Those governments and those people, high level um, uh, leaders, they are not keen on sharing what they're doing with, with people because they know that lots of people would not agree with that right and they already have their own agenda so they have just to keep it for themselves right and do not share it so i mean this is where future of life institute or even the the campaign to stop killer robots are really important they're really doing a great job putting that in front of the world so i mean it's it's up to each of us to decide whether we want to be involved in the debate whether we want to be heard whether we want to, uh, to to make decision about that or, or, or influence our government, which is not always easy, obviously, when you're under a dictatorship, uh, whatever you think about it, you have to accept the reality of the world. You will not be able to debate with the government, right? So th th this this is a, a highly complex, and even in democratic countries, the US or or here in France, for example, uh, you see that this, there is this secrecy, there's a lack of transparency about what the agenda is. So you get some reports that have been done by this or that think tank, by this or that NGO. But first of all, people do not read a long report of 70 pages. They don't have time for that. Most of the time they, are, they do not have the, um, the skills to understand it, right, uh, fully. So the, the only way maybe to make people aware of that would be the media, but even the media, they're not objective in the way they're presenting things, right? <laughs> so, so that's also a big issue. So, so I, I, I mean, we cannot count on kind of a universal debate uh, where all the citizens of the world will sit uh, around the table and discuss that. So we, we have to count on, on some, you know, institution, NGOs, once again, think tanks or, or, or figures uh, that, that, that would just promote the fact that it is really concerning. Uh, Elon Musk has done that pretty clearly about AI, saying, "Okay, we are moving toward the third, uh, you know, uh, a world war." Uh, even if the, the the way he presented it was kind of scary, uh, the hiding behind the words is, is is here, right? Where are we going? We have to ask ourselves the question before it's late. 
right there is some insane growth happening with this field of ai just recently i think meta ai there was gpt3 and then meta ai released their opt 175 billion parameter uh, nlp then i think deep mind just released their uh, gato network which is a multimodal uh, this thing so we are asking deeper questions and, and artificial intelligence is is getting more and more and more and more capable and i know the technology is a tool is is never inherently good or bad you know it, it's how we use it so i i i get worried at you know what happens if it goes to the fringe elements what are the things that is right up there in your mind which you are like really worried when it comes to artificial intelligence being leveraged for military uh, honestly, I'm, 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 I'm not worried for, for one good reason, right? I've been in the military for, for a while, and I know that it's not a matter of technology. War is awful by itself. You don't need technology to be horrible, right? So I'm not concerned about this technology. I'm concerned about the fact that we are not asking ourselves what would be the consequences, and do we really want to go toward a world where there will be this kind of humanoid? Elon Musk, you've certainly seen that. Elon Musk has decided to create the first robot, humanoid robot by the end of 2024, I guess. Um, and obviously, someone will think about, okay, what if I put a weapon in the hand of this human and then you will have the Terminator. Uh, so so I, I feel like it's something you cannot fight against because we are not strong enough. We get a lot of people that have money, that have power, that are able just to move forward with this technology. So there is no way for us to fight against that. My, my concern is not about how awful will be the wars uh, in the future because they are already awful. You can see that with Ukraine, we've seen that in Mali, we've seen that in Libya, we've seen that in Afghanistan, we're seeing that in Israel and Hamas. Uh, so wars are always awful, whatever the technology you're using or not using. Uh, my concern is that we are not taking the time to ask ourselves, is it where we want to go? Uh, in, 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 in the European Union, in many countries, we are, we are always saying that we have to ask people their consent when it comes to using, collecting or using the data, right? But we are not asking them for the consent when we are developing and using this kind of system that might, that will have strong impact on the whole world, right? And this is where I, I usually uh, like a philosopher, German philosopher who's called Hans Jonas, and, and he was talking about the, uh, the technology. It's, it's all a matter of responsibility. Is take your responsibility, but if you want to take and assume your responsibilities, you have to think about what you're doing right now and about potential. Obviously, there are consequences that cannot be foreseen, obviously, but you have to think about it and say, okay, as a nation, as a community, as a society, do I really want to go toward this kind of you know, war machines that might at some point be dangerous, even for myself, that might kill without the consent of human beings? beings without human control that might make mistakes who will be tried that's the kind of question that we are not asking they are out of the debate because governments want them to be out of the debate right they don't want the people to be involved into that uh, so um, my concern and if i'm if i may be a, a little bit uh, uh let's say pushy or straightforward on that is 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 much more human stupidity than artificial intelligence right the fact that we are we we, we are we are wanting uh both sides we are wanting to avoid the, the, the consequences the risky consequences and the harmful consequences without being involved actually so we will we let other make decisions to us and then when decisions are bad we felt oh what happened what did you do why did you do that but it's too late right if, if you want your governance your representative to make things that are aligned to your perspective your ethical uh, um, beliefs and then you have at some point to be uh, to, to be heard. You have to, to to be involved in the process. You cannot just wait them to make decision and then criticize when the decision does not match your expectations, right? So, so my concern here is that us as as human community, and and once again that we, we uh, this human community is quite unevident in some places. They don't know about technology, don't know about AI, don't know about computers, right? Um, but in, in places where we know about AI, when we know about computer, when we have access to information regarding those systems, I think that there's a lack of, you know, um, of awareness uh, about that. So sometimes you can you can see where I'm, I'm watching the news, like like every people here, like the news uh, in the evening, and say, oh, they've developed this system, so I will make my opinion, but I will not dig into that, and, and then I will you know switch to something else, which is okay. Let's say. Uh, uh, environmental issues and then I'm, I'm, I'm switching from one thing to another without really focusing on things that are really important right and, and that's the big issue with data 
once again, that's the relation with AI is that when you have too much data, you're not able to process them, right? Uh, and that, that's a big issue for human brains. So once again, I'm, I'm, I'm not concerned or I'm not scared about the future of those systems uh, because whatever the kind of war that you are fighting, they're always horrible, always horrible. Uh, I'm concerned about the fact that we're not asking the right question right now. Yeah, there is such a need for people to ask questions, to be aware of the world that they are getting into because there won't be any use complaining that, oh, nobody told me about this. You know, this is the time. I mean, you, the, the internet is full of information, you know, and but at yeah. times there's too much of information. It's, it's so important for you to kind of funnel the things which which is relevant for you rather than taking it all the information because it, it, it you can just get lost in the deluge of all this uh, information. My last question to you, uh, uh, Emmanuel, uh, what would be your advice to nations or anybody listening on what one should do you know the one who's an expert in the space i mean it's it's a very open broad question yeah but yeah yeah i i, I mean the, the first thing that i, I would, I would um, advise people is think uh, for for yourself that's the, the first thing and uh, yeah we, we just finished a course that we're giving about responsible ai to an international class here in paris and we get people from all around the world and what we were saying is that do not buy narratives make your own works right um try, try try to find out what is behind those words those narratives try try to find out what is your own ethical stance don't buy ethical stances that have been sold by the european union for example right so the first thing is that be um be curious really be curious in in, in you know the uh, the good sense of the word right <laughs> be curious in trying to search to understand then be critical not for the sake of criticism that's not the point uh develop this critical mind to make sure that you are not buying things uh that will influence your behavior right just think about it right this is something that i'm that we're doing when we're teaching um uh, here in schools is that we say to people okay regarding the ai the uh, european nar narrative on ai do not buy the narrative because behind that there is an agenda so just try to understand what is the agenda behind that because as i was saying the government will never tell you okay there is a big agenda because it's big money they will tell you okay we're doing things in the right way we are respecting ethics uh, which is not always true right so they're selling you trustworthiness they're selling you transparency and privacy and this kind of things while actually what they're trying to do is just to uh, you know get their their lion's share of this you know godsend uh, that is uh, that is promised by ai uh, so just once again be critical in the sense that you have to understand that and and for example and, and this this is the case with china the relation with china between the west and china uh, obviously you can disagree with the chinese system the problem is that right but go beyond words go beyond your beliefs and try to understand try to put yourself in the shoes of chinese people the chinese government right it's not the same to govern a country of 1.3 trillion people than 67 million in france right uh, the stakes are not the same the culture is not the same the history is not the same the geography is not the same right so it's not that you have to agree with them it's just that you have to go beyond what you you're sold here in france and 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 you did not mention it but there is this war yes you mentioned it actually uh, this war between russia and, and ukraine uh when when i when i see uh, all the the um, the media and friends are presenting that taking clearly stands for ukraine without criticizing ukraine while ukraine can be criticized also uh in, in its behavior i i feel like there is a lack of objectivity so if you buy what the media the government is telling you about the war between russia and ukraine you do not understand what really is at stake behind that right and you're not able to understand the intricacies of this kind of, of, of situation uh, and exactly the same with AI if just uh, you're just buying what your government or your media is selling to you then you do not have a clear idea of where we're going right most of the people when you discuss with people here in the west they are not aware that in some provinces in India or in some countries in Africa AI is not even the problem because it does not exist right because people their, their, their everyday ethical origin is to survive to find food it's not about thinking about Immanuel Kant and philosophy and the ethically acceptable things. That's not the point at all. And this is true in lots of places all around the world, even in France, in small you know, village, you get people, they do not even know what AI is. So when you're talking about AI and the, 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 the benefits that it can be, bring to the world, you also have to listen to those people that will tell you, I don't care about AI, right? I care about feeding my kids by the end of the day, right? That, that, that's the reality of the world. So, and this is a friend of mine from Bahrain who told me that 
uh, some months ago, and, and, and that was really interesting. He told me, you know, in, in Europe, you're, you're, you're spoiled people because you have time to sit and think about philosophy. Here, where I live, we are threatened all around by, by our neighbors. Uh, we, we are living in a situation where actually we don't have time for that. The only time we have is to make decisions to defend ourselves. You know, from from our potential enemies, right? You you you're spoiled. And and uh, honestly, in Europe, most of the people, if if not the majority, the, the wide majority of the people, they are not aware of that. We feel like the world is working like like us. No, that's not true. That's not true, right? Uh, and 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 once again, that's my advice would be: be curious, uh, be critical, and 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 think by yourself and think for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. It was a complete pleasure and a learning experience for me. And I'm sure it's going to be for the listeners also. And yes, I've I've also, you know, kind of uh, shared the same thing that, you know, be curious, be critical. And yes, you mentioned about China. I think China is doing so many uh, great things. But the narrative which is peddled by the government or the media is, is that oh, China is this and that. But I think if and only if we kind of take time and understand what they're doing you know how they uh, completely l jumped from being a copycat nation to be a nation which is challenging america and doing mm -hmm. things which is insanely awesome i think we all need to learn you know we need to keep our minds yeah. open hearts open and be curious, ask deeper question. I guess that's the path to, you know, be financially independent and be a better human being, which is yep. self-providing, not just for yourself, but the family and, and being a, a, a playing a role in, in the world of, of yep. doing better and, and being a yes. cause for a change which creates a better world. And if we yes. all have that attitude rather than just blaming and saying, oh, this nation is doing that or that organization. I, I, yes, I'm sure that the governments have, you know, are, have, are closed doors. But I hope that we, the people, you know, raise a voice and, and create a world which is more de decentralized. I know this is a little yes, weird, but you're right. And, 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 and if I may, when because you were talking about this this idea that, that obviously China is doing great things. Uh, the point when I'm talking about being critical is also being critical toward yourself, toward your perception, right? Because uh, once again, here in France, we're criticizing, for example, the social credit system that has been developed in some provinces in, in China, but we're doing the same in some in some places in France, right? So, so do not blame others, just look at yourself and say, okay, why am I thinking that? So that, that's, that's a real great point. But um, let's be idealistic, not be naive. Um, that will certainly not happen. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Thank you, Eddie. Thank to you. my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. And until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. That really was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>